Barney Kiernan's Pub. 5 p.m. I'm just passing the time of day with old Troy of the Dublin Metropolitan Police at the corner of Arbor Hill there. And be damned, but a bloody sweep comes along and he near drives his gear into me eye. Oi! I turn around to let him have the weight of me tongue when who should I see dodging along Stony Batter? Only Joe Hines. Oh, Joe. How are you blowing? Did you see that bloody sweep near shoved me eye out with his brush? Such luck. Are you a strict teetotaler? Not taking anything between drinks. Come round to Barney Kearns. I want to see the citizen. Barney Mavornin's be it. <coughs> anything strange or wonderful, Joe? I was up at that meeting in the city arms. What was that, Joe? Cattle traders about the foot and mouth disease. I want to give the citizen the hard word about it. We go round by the linen hall barracks on the back of the courthouse, talking about one thing and another. And so we turn into Barney Keenan's, and there, sure enough, is the citizen, up in the corner, having a great confab with himself and that bloody mangy mongrel, uh, Gary Owen. Gary Owen. And he waiting for what the sky would drop in the way of a drink. <laughs> <laughs> there he is in his glory hole, with his Krushkin lawn and his load of papers, working for the cause. Stand and deliver, John. That's right, citizen. Well, who's with you? Oh, friends here. It, it's me, citizen. Ah, oh, it's you, is it? The collector of bad and doubtful debts. Aye. The most notorious bloody robber you'll meet in a day's walk. Oh, that, that's me. <laughs> Pass, friends. <laughs> What's your opinion of the Times, Joe? I think the markets are on the rise. Foreign wars is the cause of it. It's the Russians' wish to tyrannise. All right, give over your bloody cotton, Joe. I've a thirst on me. I wouldn't sell for half a crown. <laughs> give it a name, citizen. Wine of the country. What's yours? Oh, ditto. Three pints, Terry. Yeah. And how's the old heart, citizen? Never better the corner. What? Gary Owen, are we going to win? Eh? <laughs> so anyhow, Terry brings the three points Joe was standing. And be got the sight nearly leaves me eye when I see him hand out a quid. True as I'm telling you, a good-looking sovereign. And there's more where that came from. Uh, Were you robbing the poor box, Joe? <laughs> huh? It was the prudent member gave me the wheeze. El Bloom, I saw him before I met you, sloping round by Pill Street with his cod's eye. <laughs> hey, drink that, citizen. I will. Help. Help, Joe. <sighs> Oh, don't be talking. I was blue meldy for the want of that point. Oh, Declare to God, I could hear it hit the pit of my stomach with a click. Oh. Alf! Huh? <laughs> Who's that? Uh, little Alf Bergen pops in round the door, squeezed up with laughing. Don't know what's up, and Alf keeps making signs out of the door. Look at him! Look, the brain! What's and be God, what is it? Only that bloody old pantaloon, Dennis Breen, in his bath slippers, with two bloody big books tucked under his oxter, and the wife hot foot after him. Unfortunate wretched woman, trotting like a poodle. I thought Alf would split. He's traipsing all around Dublin with a postcard someone sent him with U.P. up on it. To, to take it. To, to take a what? Huh? Breen. He wants to find out who sent it oh, and take out a libel action for ten thousand pounds. Oh hell! <laughs> who? Brain. He was in John Henry Menton's. Oh, and then he went around to call us some wards. Oh God, I have a pain laughing. That bloody old fool. Oh, what's that bloody Freemason doing prowling up and down outside? Was that that broom? Oh, who knows? Oh, how is how is Willie Murray? These times. Oh, oh, huh? I don't know. <laughs> I saw him just now in Capel Street with Paddy Dignam. Only I was running Paddy after... Paddy Dignam? What? Yeah, what? Huh? With who? who? Yes, with Dignam. Paddy? Yes. <laughs> don't you know he's dead? Paddy Dignam. Aye. Oh, yeah. Sure, I'm after seeing him not five minutes ago. Oh, you saw his ghost then. Oh, my God. God between us and harm. What? Dead? Yeah. No, he's not. He's no more dead than you are. Maybe so. They took the liberty of burying him this morning, anyhow. Paddy? Aye. He paid the debt of nature. Oh, Christ. I could have sworn it was Paddy. There he is again. 
Who? Bloom. He's on point duty up and down there for the last ten minutes. Then be gob, I see Bloom's fizzog do a peep in and then slither off. And a minute later, that Gary Owen starts prowling. Because old Bloom is skeezing round the door again. Come in! Come on, he won't eat you! Uh, no, of course. So, Bloom slopes in with his cod's eye on the dog. Is Martin Cunningham here? Uh, Hello, Bloom. Uh, What'll you have? Uh, Joe, I, I couldn't. No offense. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Well, well, well I... I'll just have a cigar. Ah. Gob, he's a prudent member and no mistake. Give us one of your prime stinkers, Terry. Uh, thank you. When is uh, Long John going to hang that fellow in Mountjoy? So they started talking about capital punishment, and of course Bloom comes out with the why and wherefore and all the codology of the business. I wonder if it has any such effect as the... as intended on the poor fellow. Huh? Of course, he... <laughs> It is intended to have a deterrent effect, but I... <coughs> oh and the old dog smelling them all the time. I'm told those Jews do have a sort of queer odour coming off them. There's one thing it hasn't a deterrent effect on. What's that, Alf? The poor buggers, too, that's been hanged. Oh. That's so. I heard from the head warder that was in Kilmainham when they hanged Joe Brady, the Invincible. Ruling passion, strong in death, as someone said. That can be explained by science. Oh. It's just... What? It's it's only a natural phenomenon, don't you see? Because on account of the... Then Bloom starts with his jawbreakers about... And this phenomenon, and the other phenomenon. But the citizen starts gassing about the Invincibles. Brave deeds. The man is 67. And who fears to speak in 98? Our time will come in a new Ireland. I was looking at a picture of Robert Emmett. For his country, he died. But it was a farce. He... His rebellion was a farce. Oh, no. And there's Bloom with his knock-me-down cigar, putting on a swank with his lardy face. For his country! Aye, aye! Mm. No, <laughs> you don't... You don't grasp my point. You see, what I mean Sinn is... Féin! Sinn Féin, oh, aye! Oh, the oh, friends oh, we love are by our side. The foes we hate before us. So then the citizen begins Every talking day. about the Irish language and the Shawnees that don't speak their own language and Bloom putting in his old goo with his tup in his stump. The curse of Ireland is drink. Ireland <laughs> sober is Ireland free. You see, the anti-treating league is a better idea than the Gaelic league. Teetotal is not nationalists. Anti-treating is about the size of it. Gob, Bloom would let you pour all manner of drink down his throat till the Lord would call him before you'd ever see the froth at the point that he stood you. Citizen, will you have another? I will, I call it. Uh, sure, there's no ill feeling. And I God, the citizen's not as green as his cabbage looking. Arsing around from one pub to another, leaving it to any other soul to buy the drinks. Could you make a hole in another pint? Could a swim duck? Same again, Terry. Uh... Are you sure you won't have anything in the way of liquid refreshment, Bloom? Uh, thank you, no. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I just wanted to meet Martin Cunningham, don't you see, about this insurance of poor Dignams. Uh, Martin asked me to go to the house. You see, he, uh, Dignam, I mean, mm -hmm. when he mortgaged the policy, he didn't serve any notice of the assignment on the company at the time. And nominally, under the Act, the mortgagee can't recover on the policy. Holy wars! That's a good one if old Shylock is landed. So the wife comes out top dog, what? Well, uh, that's a point uh, for the wife's admirers. Whose admirers? Uh, uh, <laughs> advisors. Uh, oh. The wife's advisors, yeah. I mean. Oh. Under the act, you see, the mortgage oh. uh, Then he starts place. mucking it up like the Lord Chancellor, giving it out on the bench. For the benefit of the wife. And that a trust is created. He near had the head of me addled. He was bloody safe he wasn't running himself under the act that time as a rogue and vagabond. El Bloom selling fake tickets for the, what do you call it, Royal Hungarian Privileged Lottery. But uh, on the other hand... Oh, commend me to an Israelite. Gentlemen, so Terry brings the three points. Here, citizen. Strong lad. Fortune, Joe. And ah, good health, citizen. Indeed, indeed. So Joe starts telling the citizen about the foot and mouth disease and the cattle traders and taking action in the matter. Go by and send them all to the right of well, We have sheep dip for the scab and a horse trench what? for coughing calves. I don't see why more... Mr. Know-all Bloom, because he was up one time in a knacker's yard. Teach your grandmother how to milk ducks. Anyhow, 
Field and Nanetti are going over tonight to London to ask about it on the floor of the House of Commons. Are you, are you sure that Councillor Nanetti is going? I wanted to see him as it happens. Well, he's going off by mail boat tonight. Nanan's going too. They told him to ask a question about the Commissioner of Police forbidding Irish games in the park. Oh, what do you God, think of that, that citizen? Ah. Here's to the citizen that made the Gaelic sports revival. Oh. The man that got away, James Stevens, That's the it. champion of all Ireland at putting the 16-pound shot. What was your best throw, citizen? Nah, Bogglish. Well, there was a time I was as good as the next fellow, anyhow. Put it there, citizen. You were, and a bloody sight better. <laughs> <laughs> So off they started at Irish sport and shown in games and the like. Putting the stone now and Harley, that's the way to build up a nation again. And of course, Bloom has to have his say too. I mean, not all exercise. But every man... If a fellow has a row as heart, some violent exercise is bad. But, but look at tennis. I declare, if you took up a straw from the bloody floor, and if you said to Bloom, look at Bloom, do you see that straw? That's a straw. I declare he'd talk about it for an hour, so he would, and talk steady. Then, Alf Bergen pipes up. Talking about violent exercise, <laughs> we had that Kyo Bennett fight. I heard Boylan made a cool hundred quid over it. Who? Blazers Boylan? Uh-huh. Uh, what, 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 what I mean about tennis, for example, is the agility, the training of the eye. Eye ah! Blazers Boylan. He let out that Kyo was on the beer to run up the odds when Kyo was training hard all the time. But don't you think, uh, Bergen, that uh, tennis... Kyo dusted the floor with him. Handed Bennett the father and mother of a beat. No, yes, Blazes knows which side his bread is buttered. I hear he's running a concert tour now up in the north. So who? Oh, oh yes, yes that's quite true. Yes, yes, kind of a summer tour, you see. Just, oh, a, see. just a holiday. Uh -huh. uh, Mrs. Bloom is the bright, particular star, isn't she? Uh -huh. <laughs> My wife, is she singing? Yes, yes. Yeah. I think it'll be a success, too. He's an excellent man to organise. Yeah. Oh, I says to myself. Excellent. Ah, okay. That explains the absence of hair on Bloom's chest. Blaze is doing the tootle on the flute. Concert tour. That's the buckle that'll organise Molly Bloom. Take my tip. <laughs> Alf Bergen is still watching out the door. Huh? Yeah. Oh, look, there goes that lunatic Breen again. You <laughs> up. <laughs> 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 Still, on account of the poor woman, I, I mean his wife. It's a pity about her. Or any other woman marries a half and half. How half and half? Do you mean... Half and half, I mean. A fella that's neither fish nor flesh. A pisho, uh, if you know what that is. Big gob, I saw there was trouble coming. But Bloom lets on he heard nothing. And he starts talking with Joe. You needn't worry about that little matter owing uh, till the first of the month. But if you would just say a yeah. word to the editor about this ad for keys. Of course I will. <coughs> Rely on me. Swindling the peasants, the poor of Ireland. We want no more strangers in our house. Because, you see, uh, for an advertisement, you, you must have repetition. That's the whole secret. Consider that done. Very, very kind. Our own fault. We let them come in. And Bloom, letting on to be awfully deeply interested in a spider's web in the corner, and the citizen scowling after him, and the dog at his feet, looking up to know who to bite and when. Small one. Ah. So anyhow, in comes Lenehan, with a face on him as long as a late breakfast. Uh, what's the latest from the scene of action? What did those tinkers in the city hall decide about the Irish language? It's on the march, anyhow. To hell with a bloody brutal assassin ox. Well, the English have exported their civilization. Their civilization, you mean? To hell with them. The curse of a good for nothing god lights sideways on the bloody thick look sons of horse gets. <laughs> Any civilization they have, they stole from us. Lennon, uh, what's up with you? You look like a fella that lost a bob and found a tower, huh? <laughs> Gold cup. Who won, Mr. Lennon? Throw away. Oh. At 20 to 1. Oh, oh, no. A rank outsider. And the rest nowhere. And Scepter? Still running for all I know. We're all in the cart. Bylan plunged two quid on my tip for himself and a lady friend. Frailty, the name is Scepter. Uh, I had a half a crown myself on Zinfandel. Throw away. 20 to 1. But Bloom and the citizen are still arguing about law and history. Some people can see the moat in others' eyes, but they can't see the beam in their own. Ramesh, there's no one so blind as the fellow that won't see. 
Where's our missing 20 millions of Irish should be here? And our patteries and textiles, the finest in the whole world. What do the filthy English owe us for our ruined trade and ruined hearts? And he takes a swig out of his point. <sighs> All wind and piss like a tanyard cat. What about our fighting navy? Who keeps our foes at bay? I'll tell you what about it. Hell upon earth it is. Flogging, slavery, that's your glorious British navy. That's the great empire they boast of. Drudges and whipped serfs. But isn't discipline the same everywhere? I mean, wouldn't it be the same here? If you put force against force. <sighs> Didn't I tell you? If he was at his last gasp, he tried to down Fascia that dying was living. We'll put force against force. We have our greater Ireland beyond the sea. Our people driven out of house and home in the Black 47. They will come again and with a vengeance. But my point was persecution. With his mud-coloured mug on him and his old plum eyes rolling about. But persecution, all the history of the world is full of it. Perpetuating national hatred among nations. Do you know what a nation means? A nation... Well, a nation is the same people living in the same place. <laughs> Be God then, if that's so, oh, I'm a nation, for I'm living in the same place for the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, or, or also living in different places. What is your nation, if I may ask? Ireland. I, I was born here. Ireland. <laughs> and I belong to a race too. A race that is hated and persecuted. Also now, this very moment, this very instant. God, he's near burning his fingers with the butt of his cigar. Are you talking about the new Jerusalem? I'm talking about injustice. Stand up to it then with force, like men. There's a picture for you. Old Bloom standing up to the business end of a gun. And then he collapses all of a sudden, twisting around as limp as a wet rag. But it's no use. Force, hatred, history, all that. It, that's not life. For men and women, insult and hatred. And, uh, well, everybody knows it's... It's the opposite of that. That, that, that. that is really life. What? Love. I mean the opposite of hatred. Uh, I must go now. Uh, just round the court to a moment to see if Martin Cunningham's here. Mm. If he comes, just say that I'll be back in it. Who's hindering you? What? And off he pops like grease lightning. A <sighs> new apostle to the Gentiles. Universal love. <laughs> Isn't that what we're told? Love thy neighbour. That chap! Beggar thy neighbour is his motto. Well, Joel, you're very good help. And more power, citizen. Ah, the blessing of God and Mary and Patrick on you. And he ups with his point to wet his whistle. Ah. I know where he's gone. Who? Bloom. The courthouse is a blind. He had a few bob and throw away, and he's going to gather in the shekels. No, that white-eyed calf here that never backed a horse in anger in his life. That's where he's gone. I met Bantam Lyons going to back that horse, only I put him off, and he told me Bloom gave him the tip. <sighs> Bet you what you like, he has a hundred shillings on the dark horse. He's the only man in Dublin who has. He's a bloody dark horse himself. Yeah, God right. save Ireland from the likes of that bloody mouse abode. Here's the man that'll tell you about it. Huh? Martin Cunningham. Oh, uh, Martin. It's Bloom I'm after. Have you gentlemen seen him? Do you know where he is? Where is he, Mr Cunningham? The fraud and widows and orphans, the Israelites. Right. Why can't a Jew love his country like the next fella? Uh, Isn't he a cousin of Bloom, the dentist? Not at all, only namesakes. His name is Virag. The father's name that poisoned himself. He changed it by deed, Paul, the father did. That's the new messiah for Ireland. Ireland of saints and sages. <laughs> well, the Jews are still waiting for their redeemer. For that matter, so are we. Every male that's born, they think it may be their messiah. And every Jew is in a tall state of excitement, I believe, till he knows if he's a father or a mother. <laughs> you should have seen Bloom before that son of his that died was born. Uh -huh. I met him one day in the South City Markets buying a tin of baby food six weeks before the wife delivered. Do you call that a man? It'd be an act of God to take hold of a fella like that and throw him into the sea. Yeah, right. Sloping off with his fight quid without putting up a pint of yeah. stuff like a man. Charity <laughs> to the neighbour. Uh, but where is he? We can't uh, wait. A wolf in sheep's clothing, that's what he is. Virag from Hungary. He has you here, as I call him. <laughs> Cursed by God. Then be damned, but in comes Bloom again, letting on to be in a hell of a hurry. Oh, Martin, I was just round at the courthouse looking for you. I hope I'm not... Uh... No, no, we're ready. Five quid! Uh, don't tell anyone! 
Beg your pardon? Come on, boys. Ah, that's right. Oh, no. Go to the and Martin sees it's looking blue and gets Bloom out as quick as he can. So Bloom gets up on the jarvey with Martin, all at sea. But the citizen comes waddling to the door with Alf round him like a leprechaun. No, no, citizen, leave it be now. Three cheers for Israel. I don't see why I should Drive put up, up with that. Just... <laughs> Sit down, please, Sir Mendelssohn. Off you go. go. Mendelssohn was a Jew. Bloom, sit down for God's sake. Uh, Mendelssohn was a Jew. And uh, Karl Marx and Spinoza. Bloom. And the Saviour was a Jew and his father was a Jew. Your God. Bloom, that'll do now. Drive ahead. Your God was a Jew. Who's God? Christ was a Jew, like me. Boy, Jesus, I'll we'll brain that like bloody Jew, Jew man for Jew. using the holy name. Oi, Jesus, no survive. Hey, hey, give us that biscuit box there. No, 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 stop. Stop now. Stop. Easy, stop. easy. Did I murder him. You never saw the like of it in all your born puff. Gob, if Bloom gets that tin on the side of his pole, he'll remember the gold cup he will sow. The driver saves Bloom's life by whipping up and off. Did I kill him or what? Oh, after him, Gary. After him, bye. And the last we see is the bloody drivey round in the corner and old sheep-faced Bloom on us gesticulating and the bloody mongrel after it for all he was bloody well worth to tear them limb from limb. When lo, there came about them all a great brightness and they beheld the chariot wherein he stood ascend to heaven. And they beheld him in the chariot clothed in the glory of the brightness, fair as the moon, and terrible, that for awe they durst not look upon him. And there came a voice out of heaven calling, Elijah! Elijah! And Ben Bloom answered, Abba Adonai! And they beheld even him, Ben Bloom Elijah, amid clouds of angels ascend the glory of the brightness, at an angle of 45 degrees over Dunnyhue's in Little Green Street, like a shot off a shovel. Sandy Main Strand, Dublin Bay, 8 p.m. The summer evening had begun to fold the world in its mysterious embrace and the last glow of all too fleeting day lingered lovingly on the weed-grown rocks along Sandy Mount shore. <laughs> the three girlfriends were seated on the rocks. Many a time and oft were they wont to come there to that favourite nook to have a cosy chat beside the waves. Gertie McDowell, Sissy Caffrey and Edie Boardman, with the baby in the pushcar and Tommy and Jackie Caffrey two little curly-headed twins dabbling in the sand with their spades and buckets. Edie Boardman was rocking the chubby baby to and fro and Sissy Caffrey bent over him. And Gertie McDowell was seated near her companions, lost in her own thoughts. Sissy Caffrey was awfully fond of children, thought Gertie. A truer-hearted lass never drew the breath of life, always with a laugh in her gypsy-like eyes. Come here, Tommy. And you, Jackie. He pushed me. I for shame to throw poor Tommy in the dirty sand. Wait till I catch you for that. Ah, oh, poor Tommy. What's your name? Butter and cream? Tell us who is your sweetheart. Is Sissy your sweetheart? No. Is Edie Boardman your sweetheart? No. I know who is Tommy's sweetheart. Gertie is Tommy's sweetheart. No. Edie, he needs it. Oh, yes. Take him there behind the push car where the gentleman can't see. But who is Gertie? Gertie McDowell was, in truth, as fair a specimen of winsome Irish girlhood as one could wish to see. Her figure was slight but graceful, inclining even to fragility. But those iron jelloids she'd been taking a late had done her a world of good, much better than the Widow Welch's female pills. Her rosebud mouth was a genuine Cupid's bow. 
Her hands were of finely veined alabaster and as white as lemon juice could make them. Though it was not true she used to wear kid gloves in bed. Bertha Supple told that once to Edie Boardman, a deliberate lie when she was black out at daggers drawn with Gertie. And just now, at Edie's words, a telltale flush crept into her cheeks. She looked so lovely in her sweet, girlish shyness. Oh, yes. Gertie is Tommy's sweetheart. Mind he doesn't wet his new tan shoes. Gertie knew right well what made squinty Edie say that. Edie's nose was out of joint about Reggie Wiley always riding up and down in front of Gertie's window. Only now his father kept him in in the evening, studying hard to get an exhibition in the intermediate that was on. He was going to Trinity College to study for a doctor when he left the high school. Little wrecked he perhaps for what Gertie now felt. That dull ache and void in her heart. Reggie was undeniably handsome. And he was what he looked, every inch a gentleman. The shape of his head, too, at the back she would know anywhere. And the way he turned his bicycle at the lamp with his hands off the bars. And Edie Boardman thought she was so frightfully clever. But he didn't go and ride up and down in front of her bit of garden. Edie, is he done? Barely. Just doing his little knickerbockers for him. Gertie was wearing her blue undies for luck. But a gnawing sorrow was there all the time. Her very soul is in her eyes, and she would give worlds to be in the privacy of her own familiar chamber where she could have a good cry and relieve her pent-up feelings. Gertie MacDowell yearns in vain. Reggie was too young to understand. He would not believe in love, a woman's birthright. The night of the party long ago in Stowers, he was still in short trousers. When they were alone, and he stole an arm around her waist, and she went white to the very lips. He called her little one in a strangely husky voice, and snatched a half-kiss the first. But it was only the end of her nose, and then he hastened from the room with a remark about refreshments. Impetuous fellow. Strength of character had never been Reggie Wiley's strong point, and he who would woo and win Gertie MacDowell must be a man among men. And while Edie Boardman was with little Tommy behind the pushcar, she was just thinking, would the day ever come when she could call herself his little wife-to-be? Tommy, have you done? Yes. And run off and play with Jackie. And be good and don't fight. She would care for him with creature comforts. They would have a beautifully appointed drawing room with pictures and engravings and the photograph of Grandpa Giltrap's lovely dog, Gary Owen, that almost talked. It was so human. And chintz covers for the chairs. And before he went out to business every morning, he would give his dear wifey a good, hearty hug and gaze for a moment deep down into her eyes. I want the ball! No, Tommy. Baby is playing with the ball, and if you take it, there'll be weeks on the green. It's my ball, and I want it! The temper of him! He's a man already! No, no, be off with you. Don't give it to him, sissy. You're not my sister, it's my ball. Oh, give it him. And she took the ball and threw it along the sand and Tommy after it in full career. You shouldn't let him have his own way. Anything for a quiet life. Oh, I'd like to give him something so I would. Where I won't say. On the B.O.T. Ton. The idea of Sissy saying something like that out loud. Sissy, I'm sure the gentleman in black over there heard what you said. Let him. Give it to him, too, on the same place. Quick as look at him. <laughs> Madcap, sis, will you ever forget the evening? She dressed up in her father's suit and hat and the burned cork moustache and walked down Tritonville Road smoking a cigarette. <laughs> the twins were now playing in the most approved fashion till at last Master Jackie kicked the ball as hard as he could down towards the seaweedy rocks. Luckily... The gentleman in black who was sitting there by himself intercepted the ball. Could you throw it back, please? 
Uh, here you are. The gentleman aimed the ball at Sissy, but it rolled down the slope and stopped right under Gertie's skirt. Oh, sorry. My ball, my ball. Gertie drew back her foot and gave a kick, <laughs> but she missed. <laughs> if you fail, try again. Pure jealousy, of course. It was nothing else to draw attention on account of the gentleman opposite looking. Till then, they'd only exchanged glances of the most casual, but now, under the brim of her hat, she ventured a look at him. And the face that met her gaze there in the twilight, wan and strangely drawn, seemed to her the saddest she had ever seen. Gertie gazed out towards the distant sea, and while she gazed, her heart went pit-a-pat. Yes, it was her he was looking at, and there was meaning in his look. His eyes burned into her. Wonderful eyes they were. But could you trust them? She could see at once by his dark eyes and his pale intellectual face that he was a foreigner. He was in mourning, she could see, and the story of a haunt and sorrow was written on his face. Here was that of which she had so often dreamed. The very heart of the girl woman went out to him. Her dream husband, because she knew on the instant it was him. If she could make him fall in love with her, make him forget the memory of the past. The exasperating little brats of twins began to quarrel again and Jackie threw the ball down towards the sea and they both ran after it. Little monkeys common as ditch water. Where are they off to? Tide might come in on them and be drowned. Jackie, Tommy, oh, this is the very last time I bring them out. So Sissy jumps up and runs down the slope past the gentleman. Jackie, Tommy. Just because she was a good runner, she runs like that so he could see all the end of her petticoat and her skinny shanks as far up as possible. Come here, the both of you. It would have served Sissy just right if she tripped up over something. That would have been a very charming expose for a gentleman like that to witness. Gotcha! Sissy came up along the strand with the two twins and their ball. Gertie just took off her hat for a moment to settle her hair, and a prettier head of nut-brown tresses was never seen on a girl's shoulders. She could almost see the swift, answering flush of admiration in the dark eyes of the gentleman in black that set her tingling in every nerve. She put on her hat so that she could see from underneath the brim and swung her buckled shoe faster, for her breath caught as she caught the expression in his eyes. He was eyeing her as a snake eyes its prey. Penny for your thoughts. What? I was only wondering, was it, Lee? Jackie, I'm telling you, I won't bring you again. Sissy, what's the time? Half past kissing time. Time to kiss again. No, but we need to know. They told us to be in early. I'll ask the gentleman over there what's the time by his conundrum. So over she went, and when the gentleman saw Sissy coming, he took his hand out of his pocket, getting nervous and beginning to play with his watch chain. Excuse me? Uh, yes? Would you mind please telling me the right time? Oh, of course, uh... Oh. What? Uh, I'm very sorry. My watch has stopped. Dear me. I think it must be after eight, uh, because the sun has set. Thanks, mister. One moment he had been there, fascinated by a loveliness that made him gaze... And the next moment, it was the quiet, grave-faced gentleman, self-control expressed in every line of his distinguished-looking figure. What do you say? Uncle says his waterworks are out of order. What? His watch has stopped. It's high time we went anyhow. I'll just set these two to rights. Gertie saw him putting his watch away in the gathering twilight. It was getting darker, but he could see. And he was looking all the time that he was winding the watch or whatever he was doing to it. And then he put it back 
and put his hands back into his pockets. His dark eyes fixed themselves on her again, drinking in her every contour. Her heart told her he was her all in all. Time to go! Just look at your hair, Jackie. Look at it. Gertie, you're awfully quiet. Are you pining for Reggie? Is it your best boy throwing you over? Gertie winced sharply. Edie had her own quiet way of saying things that she knew would wound like the confounded little cat she was. Why should I care about him? I can throw my cap at who I like because it's a leap year. There was that in her young voice that told that she was not one to be lightly trifled with. As for Mr. Reggie with his swank and his bit of money, she could just chuck him aside as if he was so much filth and tear his silly postcard into a dozen pieces. Billy Winks is coming, baby Boardman. Yes, he is. The Sandman is on his way. Oh, my, pudding me pie. He has his bib destroyed. Gertie, are you not coming? Oh, Look, Sissy, is it lightning? It's fireworks. Come on down the strand and we can see over the house. Come on. Come on, Gertie, it's the bizarre firework. I can see from where I am. She had no intention of being at their beck and call. If they could run like Rosie's, she could sit. The eyes that were fastened upon her set her pulses tingling. She looked at the gentleman a moment, meeting his glance. And a light broke in upon her. White hot passion was in that face. At last they were left alone without the others to pry and pass remarks. His hands and face were working and a tremor went over her. She leaned back far to look up where the fireworks were. And she caught her knee in her hand so as not to fall back looking up. And there was no one to see, only him, when she revealed all her graceful, beautifully shaped legs like that. Look! There's another! Look! And she leaned back ever so far to see the fireworks. And she saw a long Roman candle going up over the trees, up, up. And they were all breathless with excitement as it went higher and higher. And she had to lean back more and more to look after it. And he could see her other things too, and she let him. She saw that he saw, and then it went so high it was out of sight for a moment. And she was trampling in every limb from being so far back that he had a full view, and she wasn't ashamed. And he kept on looking, looking. She would have cried to him, held out her snowy arms to him to come, and then a rocket sprang. And then the Roman candle Bust, and it gushed out of it a stream of gold. And they were all greeny, dewy stars falling with golden. Then all melted away dewily in the grey air. She drew herself up to her full height. Their souls met in a last lingering glance. And the eyes that reached her heart were full of a strange shining. She half smiled at him. A sweet forgiven smile. And then they parted. Tight boots. No, she's lame. Oh, poor girl. That's why she stayed on the rock while the others did a sprint. Thought something was wrong by the cut of her jib. Jilted beauty. Glad I didn't know it when she was on show. Hot little devil all the same. Damn glad I didn't do it in the bath this morning. I dare say she felt I saw something in me. Wonder what? You never know. 
pretty girls and ugly men marrying beauty and a beast, took off her hat to show her hair, hair strong in rot. <laughs> Ten bob I got from Molly's combings when we were on the rocks in Holly Street. Why not? Suppose if Boylan gave her money. Why not? She's worth fifteen, more, a pound. I think so. Funny, my watch stopped at half past four. Was that just when Boylan? When she? Oh, he did. Into her, she did. Done. Shirt's all wet. Oh Lord, that little limping devil! First kiss does the trick. Remember that till their dying day. Lieutenant Mulvey that kissed Molly under the Moorish wall beside the gardens. Fifteen, she told me. After Glen Cree dinner, that was when we drove home by the Featherbed Mountain, gnashing her teeth in sleep. Lord Mayor had his eye on her too. Oh, there she is with them. Down there for the fireworks. Gertie, they called her. Up like a rocket, down like a stick. And the children twins, they must be. And the dark one with the mop head. I knew she could whistle. Mouth made like that. Like Molly. Would you mind please telling me the right time? <laughs> I'll tell you the right time up a dark lane. Didn't look back when she was going down the strand. Those hills, those girls, those lovely seaside hills. Did she know what I? Of course. Did me good all the same. When she leaned back, your head it simply swells. <laughs> That's right. Gertie. Waiting for something to happen. It lasts only a few years till they settle down to pot walloping and the baby. Washing child. Washing corpse. Children's hands always round them. Oh, Mrs. Purifoy. Must call to the hospital. Wonder is Nurse Callan there still? Bailey light on Hoth. Two. Four. Six, eight, nine. Has to change, or the sailors might think it a house. All quiet on Hoth now. The distant hills seem where we. I am a fool, perhaps. Boiling gets the plums, and I the plum stones. Where I come in. All that old hill has seen. Names change. That's all. Tired I feel now. Will I get up? She kissed me. My youth. Never again. Only once it comes, or hers. No, it returns. Think you're escaping and run into yourself. Longest way round is the shortest way home. What's that? Flying about? Swallow? Nerve they have to fly over the ocean and back. Lots must be killed in storms. Dreadful life sailors have too. Married too. Sometimes away for years at the ends of the earth somewhere. Wife in every port, they say. How can they like the sea? Yet they do. When you go out, you never know what dangers. Hang onto a plank or a stride of a beam for grim life. Life belt around him, gulping salt water. That's the last of his nibs till the sharks catch hold of him. Far out over the sands, the coming surf creeps, grey, and far on Kish Bank, the anchored lightship twinkles, winks at Mister Bloom. Life those chaps out there must have, stuck in the same spot. Day million me went out for the pleasure cruise, and it came on to blow. My daughter, no sign of funk. Her blue scarf, loose, laughing. Don't know what death is at that age. 
only troubles wildfire and nettle rash. <laughs> Calomel purge, I got her for that. After getting better, asleep with Molly, I felt her pulse ticking. Little hand it was. Now, big. All that the hand says when you touch. Loved to count my waistcoat buttons. <laughs> Her growing pains at night. Calling. Wakening me. Frightened she was when her nature came on her first. Poor child. Strange moment for the mother, too. Brings back her girlhood. Gibraltar. Molly told me, looking out over the sea. I always thought I'd marry a lord, or a gentleman with a private yacht. Why me? <laughs> because you were so foreign from the others. <laughs> Better not stick here all night like a limpet. Go home. No, might still be up. Call to the hospital to see how is poor Mrs. Purefoy. Hope she's over the labour. Long day I've had. Letter from Martha. The bath, funeral, house of keys. Museum with those goddesses. Daedalus' song, then that brawl and Barney Kiernan's. Got my own back there. What I said about his god made him wince. Your god was a Jew like me. Mistake to hit back? No. They ought to go home and laugh at themselves. Always want to be swilling in company. Oh, better go. Better. I'm tired to move. Exhausted, that female has me. Not so young now. Will she come here tomorrow? Will I? Chance. You'll never meet again. But it was lovely. Goodbye, dear. Thanks. Made me feel so young. Oh, must be near nine. Liverpool boat's long gone. And Molly can do the other. Did, too. And Boylan's Belfast tour. I won't go. Let him. Just close my eyes a moment. Won't sleep, though. Mr. Bloom leans back, closes his eyes. Oh, sweetie, we too naughty. She, him, half past bed. Met him by causes. Frillies for Raoul, too. Perfume your wife. Black hair. With open mouth, his left boot sanded sideways, leans, breathes. Young eyes, Mulvey. Plump, she rusty sleep. Wonder years, dreams. Return, tail end. Agendat, swoony, lovey. Showed me uh... a bat flew here, there, here. Far in the grey, a bell chimed. Hollis Street Maternity Hospital, 10 p.m. Turn right. Go to Hollis Street. Turn right and let us go to Hollis Street. Prose style, chaotic embryonic.
Anyone so is there who, in illuminated so as not to perceive that as no nature's boon can contend against the bounty of increase, so it behoves every most just citizen... It's a good idea to have a maternity hospital. Certainly in every public work which in it anything of gravity contains preparation should be with importance commensurate and... So they built one on Hollis Street. Prose style, Anglo-Saxon. Before born babe Bliss had, within womb he won worship. A couch by midwives attended. And Mrs. Purfoy is in the maternity hospital undergoing her third night of labor. In the high sunbright, well-built fair home of mothers when, far gone, it is come by her thereto to lie in. Some man that wayfaring was stood by the house door at night's oncoming. Of Israel's folk was that man, stock Ruth of man, his errand that him lone led Till that house. Mr. Bloom has come to see how Mrs. Purefoy is getting on because he feels sorry for her. In Ward Wary, the watcher, hearing that man mild hearted, rising with sway, he wimpled to him, her gate wide undid. Nurse Callan opens the door to him. Mr. Bloom, come in. Thank you. Low to Irk in Horn's Hall, hat holding, the seeker stood. Let me take your hand. Light swift, her eyes kindled. Thank you. Bloom of blushes, his word winning. How fares it with the woman who lies here in childbed? Prose style of Thomas Mallory's Mort Dartha. She is the throes now full three days, and it will be a hard birth to bear, but in a little it will be. The what is... Oh, the young students are having a... And whilst they spake, the door of the castle was opened, and there nighed them a mickle noise as of many that sat there at meat. And there came against the place as they stood, a young learning knight, eclept Dixon. It's Mr. Dixon, isn't it? It had happened they had had ado, each with other, in the house of Misericord, where this learning knight lay. By cause, the traveller Leopold came there to be healed, for he was sore wounded in his breast by a horrible and dreadful dragon. You dressed my bee sting. Hmm. So I did. But the learning knight would not hear say nay, and the traveller Leopold went into the castle for to rest him for a space, being sore of limb after many marches in divers lands. And in the castle was set a board that was of the birch wood, and on this board were frightful swords and knives, and there was a vat of silver that was moved by craft to open in the which lay strange fishes without an head. Have a tin sardine. Oh, no, I, uh, a glass of beer. Uh, thank you. And child Leopold took a pertly, somewhat in amity. Very kind. And anon, full privily, he voided his the more part in his neighbour glass, and his neighbour missed not of his wild. For heaven's sake, gentlemen, can't oh. you keep the noise down? There's a woman upstairs being three days at oh, Sorry, sorry, Nurse Callan. Sir Leopold Bloom saw a Franklin that hight Lenahan on that side the table and spoke to him full gently. She hath waited marvellous long. I'm expecting each moment to be her next. Now let us speak of that fellowship that was there to the intent to be drunken, and they might. There was a sort of scholars along either side of the board. Now, Lenehan, you know. Uh, yes. Uh, Madden, uh, yes. Crotters, Punch Costello, oh, Lynch, Stephen Dedalus. Stephen, yeah. yes, yes. Sir Stephen Dedalus was the most drunken that demands still more of mead. We're waiting for Mulligan. He said he'd be here. And Sir Leopold sat with them, for he bore fast friendship to Sir Simon Dedalus and to this his son, young Stephen, for they were right witty scholars style of Thomas More. And he heard their reasons, each against other, as touching birth and righteousness. Well, if it comes to it, the view of the church is that the child should live and the mother die. Yeah. Nay, nay, the wife right. should live and the babe to die. All their bachelors now asked of Sir Leopold. Sir, as a married man, so would you, oh. in like, so jeopardy the person of the wife to save the child? For weariness of mind, Sir Leopold would answer as fit it all. Uh, well, in so seldom seen an accident, it is good for Mother Church to have belike at one blow, birth and death <laughs> Well, that is truth, party. Which hearing, young Stephen was a marvellous glad man. He who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord. For he was of a wild manner when he was drunken. But Sir Leopold was passing grave by cause he still had pity of the women in their labour. And as he was minded of his good lady Molly, that had borne him an only man-child, 
which on his eleventh day had died, and no man of art could save. And she was wondrous stricken of heart for that evil hap, and for his burial did dress him in a fair corslet of lamb's wool, lest he might lie cold. And now Sir Leopold, that had of his body no man-child for an heir, looked upon his friend's son, Stephen, and was shut up in sorrow for his own forepast happiness. So grieved he also in no less measure for young Stephen, for that he lived riotously with those wastrels, and murdered his goods with whores. Rose, Elizabethan. Philip, Philip, quaff ye this mead, which is not indeed parcel of my body, but my soul's body Hereupon Lenehan would sing a bawdy cat. No gaseful turmoil will shorten the honor of my god. Oh. Sorry, nurse. <laughs> Daedalus, what was the reason why you did not take friar's vows? Obedience in the womb, chastity in the tomb, and involuntary poverty on my days. I, I, I hear you besmirched the lily virtue of a confiding female. Oh, no, no, I am the eternal son and ever virgin. Have a care! God is angered for your hell praising paganry! And he, Stephen, that had erst challenged to be so doughty, waxed pale and his heart shook within the cage of his breast. Old Nobber Daddy is in his cups. No, I won't lag behind his almighty lead. It is no other thing but a hubbub noise. The discharge from the thunderhead, a natural phenomenon. Pro style. John Bunyan. But was young Boasthard's fear vanquished by Karma's words? No. For he had in his heart a spike named bitterness. Pro style. Samuel Pepys. Thursday, 16th June. Patrick Dignam lain in clay of an apoplexy. After hard drought, please God, rained. On the street, Malachy Mulligan chanced against Alec Bannon, new got to town from Mullingar. Ah, Malachy! What do you here? I am for Andrew Horne's house to crush a cup of wine with debt. I would tell you of a skittish heifer in Mullingar. A photo girl. Millie is her name. So both together to Horne's. There Leopold Bloom of Crawford's Journal sitting snug with a covey of wags and Stephen D. Bloom there for Mistress Purifoy. Poor body two days past her term. God give her soon issue. Tis her ninth chick to live. Our worthy acquaintance, Mr. Malachy Mulligan, now appeared in the doorway with a young gentleman. His name, Alec Bannon. Oh, Mr. Bloom. Sir. Sir, are you in need of any professional assistance we could give? I am here about a lady in an interesting condition to know if her happiness has yet taken place. Mr. Dixon, our word, please. Oh. Pro style, Oliver Goldsmith. Miss Callan entered and having spoken a few words with young Mr. Dixon, retired with a profound bow to the company. I'm needed on the ward. Merciful Providence has been pleased to put an end to the sufferings of the lady, oh. and she has given birth to a bouncing boy. Oh, oh Lord be praised. Pro style, Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Uh, to express my notion of the thing... Uh, Mr. Blue? Uh, <coughs> one must have a cold constitution and a frigid genius not to be rejoiced by this freshest news of the fruition of her confinement, mm, yeah. since she has been in such pain through no fault of hers. <laughs> it was her husband's that put her in that expectation. <laughs> I cannot but extol the virile potency of the old bucko. Oh, no, no. Conjugal with some other, some man in the gap. A clerk in order. A link boy. A sergeant at arms. In vain, the voice of Mr. Canvasser Bloom was heard to urge to mollify, to restrain. Yeah, gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, please. <laughs> Prose style, please. Horace Walpole, Gothic. Then Malachy Mulligan told them a tale to freeze them with horror. He conjured up the scene. A secret panel behind the chimney slides back, and in the recess, Haynes. Yes, me. Loathing is depicted on all faces while he eyes us with a ghastly grin. I anticipated some reception for which it seems history is to blame. My hell and Ireland's is this life. 
A spectre stalks me. Destruction, the Black Panther. By the by, meet me at Western Row Station at ten past eleven. He is gone. Mr. Bloom, the bottle is with you. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, Pro style, Thomas Henry Huxley. I was wondering, amongst medical gentlemen, uh, why a, a child of normally healthy parents and seemingly a healthy child and, and properly looked after succumbs unaccountably early in childhood, though other children of the same marriage do not. Nature has her own good and cogent reasons. A survival of the fittest. God is an omnivorous yeah. being. Why shouldn't he find gastric relief in a collation of staggering bob? Staggering bob? The cookable and eatable parts of a calf. Newly dropped. I see. Pro style. Walter Pater. The stranger Bloom regards the face of Stephen. A scene disengages itself in the observer's memory. I remember a shaven space of lawn one soft May evening. The grove of lilacs of Roundtown at Matt Dillon's where I first met Molly. Fragrant spectators of the game when we were playing bowls. A fragrant sisterhood stood round that grey urn to watch. Dillon's daughters were watching and Molly... And Mrs. Dedalus was there. A lad of four or five in Lindsay Woolsey is standing on the urn. He frowns a little, just as this young man does now. Stephen. That little boy was Stephen. The child frowns, enjoying the danger, but must needs glance at Wiles towards where his mother watches from the piazzetta, giving a faint shadow of reproach in her glad look. Pro style, Thomas Carlyle. Box! Out flings my Lord Stephen, giving the cry. To the pub! To the pub! To the pub! And a tag and bobtail of all them after. Cockerel, jackanips, punctual bloom. Are you coming? Grabbing at headgear, ash plants, Panama hats and whatnot. Boys, please, the noise! To burst! Nurse Callan, taken aback in the hall, cannot stay. The door! Open! Ha! Bloom tarries with the nurse. Nurse Callan, all well? A bouncing boy! Or send up a kind word from me. Dr. Diet and Dr. Quiet. Quite so. But, madame, when comes stalk bird for thee? <laughs> Oh, Mr. Plume, go on with you. <laughs> Pro style. Slag. Keep a watch on the clock, choking out time. Who's standing this here, dude? Deadly. Five number one. Five it Mr. is. Mr. Plume, sir. A ginger cordial. I'm sad for me. Are you sure that's... That's my tipple. Merci. Yes. Yes. Steve, boy, you're going at some. I'm sad for More that. bloody drunk. We will all drink green poison and the devil take the hind lot. Landlord, landlord, have you good wines? Taboo. Nearly closing time, gents. Crikey, I'm about sprung. Drink up, gents. Here, Lynch, sign on along with me. We too for the body house. Right, old Edelis, any old time. We too will seek the kips where Shady Mary is. Who's the Johnny in the black dots? Bloom. Mm. Come on, you triple extract of infamy. We'll give him the slip. <laughs> <laughs> 